Welcome to the Judson Road Church of Christ YouTube channel. My name is Cade Blunt, and I will be your speaker for today's lesson. Um, I know I'm not your regular speaker. Uh, Tyler Sams, as most of us know, has gone on to San Antonio to begin preaching there. And we all wish the best for his family as they move in on to San Antonio. Um, several of you may recognize my voice. Um, I'm one of our college students from Judson Road. I'm currently at Florida College, and the elders have provided me with the opportunity to give some lessons out of the studies I've done here and some things. And that is what my intent today is to just give you a lesson about Christ. Um, the title of this series is Jesus is More Than Your Friend. A while back I was listening to a buddy preach and he kind of said something along those lines in passing, but that kind of got my brain turning. Um, the gist of it is, is that a lot of times in today, today's world, people present Christ as kind of like a friend or a buddy who's just kind of there to tell you everything's okay pat you on the back and kind of just move you along and not really be a life-changing figure. And that's and that's just not the reality. Um, and that's kind of what I want to focus on. I want to focus on these different roles Christ play that changes the life of people who follow him. And the first part of this I want to focus on is Christ, the sea. Um, this is a, particularly an Old Testament theme we see, but one that eventually comes and plays out in the New Testament. So, if you'd like to follow along with me today, we're going to be starting in Genesis chapter 17, um, particularly verse 5. The first figure I'm going to trace the seed of Christ through is going to be Abraham, the father of Israel. We are introduced to Abraham in Genesis 12, just a couple chapters after the story that was concluded. As we go through the Abraham story, we see that he's faced by challenges from God um, one of the first ones being the initial call God gives to Abraham to leave his home country and to go out into Canaan. And we see that he does that without any hesitation and completely passes this challenge or trial, however you want to word it, that God puts before him. But another one that we see he fails in is that when he's gone on his way to Egypt with his wife Sarah and he's set upon by outsiders that he just kind of wilts and doesn't have any faith in God to protect him. And it goes as far to lie to these men and tell them that, you know, Sarah, his wife, is actually just a sister, just to try to get out of any harm instead of having faith that God would deliver him. So as we see, Abraham is not a perfect man. And is it's just very, you see him in some great light sometimes and some not so great light. So after a handful of these trials, though, God makes some covenants with Abraham. Um, so, if you want to read along, we're just going to read through these covenants. Uh, starting in verse 5 of Genesis 17, we're going to read 5 through 9, and then I'm going to read 16 through 19. So, if, um, I'll give you kind of a break between. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and a king shall come out of thee. Now I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land, wherein thou art a stranger, and all of the Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee, and their generations. Now just to kind of establish what was just said, God has made two promises to Abraham here, um, and we're going to get more context on one of them in the following verses I'm about to read. But we see that he's going to have a nation, or some form of a seed after him, and that they're going to be given the land of Canaan. So jump with me to 16 through 19, and we're going to give some more context to this idea of a seed. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her, yea, I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. So 16-19 through 19 just kind of gives us a one, it's an awesome verse to read, that the power of God, even to these elderly people that are Abraham and Sarah is willing to give them a son and gives them the ability to even conceive a son. It's just amazing. But not only that, 
we see that this is he's going to make sure the seed promise happens. He, and it's not only going to go just with Abraham, but it's going through his sons. It's going through his seed. So, where do we see this covenant that's going to lead to Christ, though? We understand that, yes, Abraham's going to have a nation, but how does Christ fit into this picture? Well, to start getting that understanding, we're going to be going a little farther into Genesis. Um, but after being the son Isaac, the final promise of these three covenants is going to be made to Abraham. So turn over with me to Genesis 22. The context here, the son that God has promised Abraham. God has just told Abraham to sacrifice him. Now, I'm not a parent personally or anything, but I'm sure this is not an easy thing. But we don't ever see a bit of hesitation from Abraham. We just see that Abraham goes, and he doesn't initially tell Isaac what's about to happen, but he does it, and he tries to go through with it. But if you look at verses 10 and 11, um, we're just going to read them real quick. Abraham stopped by an angel of the Lord. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now that I know that thou fearest God, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So we see here in these verses, Abraham is stopped and does not have to sacrifice his son. But the important part is what comes after. In verse 15, the angel begins relaying a message that shows this new promise in verse 18. So we're, let's read it. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for, thou, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven in the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of the, his enemies. And in thy seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. That's the verse I want to focus on. Verse 18. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This is where Christ comes in. This is the promise of Christ. I know it's not clear here, but as we kind of build the context here later on, I definitely wanted you to keep that in the back of your mind. That this still promise starts with Abraham. So where do we go from here? Abraham to who? Who's the next major figure? David. David, um, we oftentimes see parallels between David and Christ because they are of the same lineage, and this promise extends to David. So we know he's the next major figure. He's We all are familiar with the story. He's the king of Israel and a man after God's own heart. Where we see this promise of a seed is First Chronicles 28. So let's flip over there. Um, I'm going to be flipping along with you, so I'm not necessarily going to be the quickest. Um, the context for this passage is that David has just asked to build the temple, and God has denied him that right. So let's read through it, and we're going to see what's kind of the start of this seed promise for David. <clears throat> and David assembled all the princes of Israel, and the princes of the tribes, and the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course, and the captains over the thousands, and the captains over the hundreds. And the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king, and of his sons, with the officers, and with the mighty men, and with all the, vigil, the valiant men of Jerusalem. <clears throat> then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren, my people, as for me, I had nine ark of the covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God, and had made ready for the building. But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build an house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war, and hast shed blood. Howbeit the Lord God of Israel choose me before all my, the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler. And of the house of Judah, the house of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon my son to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he hath built my house in my... Courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, 
and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgment at, as at this day. Therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God. For ye may possess this good land, and leave it for an inheritance of your children after you forever. So what we see here is the continuation of this promise. Um, I'll particularly want to focus on verse 7. I will establish his kingdom forever. So what we get here is kind of a reiteration of both the nation promise and that seed promise. That this line, this kingdom that's been built is going to last. But that doesn't really give us that Christ feel. But we understand that in the same way the Abraham one was given, where Christ wasn't necessarily right there at the first, we see him restated and later on. So if you want to, well, how do we fit Christ in? How do we put Christ in here? Flip over with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We'll be looking at verses 11 through 14. Now, what's the context for this passage? It's actually the same as the passage we just read. David has asked to build the temple and due to the things David has done being a man of war having spilled blood and having been the man that David was God is not going to allow him to build the temple he'll allow Solomon his son to do it but not David but there is an important passage here an important idea an important blessing that God does state will come through David so follow along with me in verse 11 and and it's since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee, he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of the, thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. I want to focus on something in particular here. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He shall be my son. That language, what does that point to? Because we know Christ is the Son of God. Not necessarily the Chosen of God, anything like that. He is the Son of God. And he has established a kingdom forever. This language parallels what we hear of Christ. Parallels that David's line is going to continue. And parallels that Christ is the Son. It parallels all of it. And I don't think that's unintentional. I think oftentimes when we see these things, they are very much intentional in our Bibles. And I think this all points to Christ. I want to take one other look at a passage here um, in regards to David that point also points this way. If you want to, turn over with me to Psalm 89. Um, this isn't a Psalm of David or anything like that. Um, it's one of the other Psalms written by a different author. But it has some very meaningful sayings in it when it comes to this painting the picture of Christ as part of the line of David. So, we're going to read verses 3 or 4 and then verses 26 through 29. I have made a covenant with my chosen, and I have sworn unto, my, unto David my servant. Thy seed I will establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Now jump with me down to verse 26. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed will I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. Now isn't that full of messianic and Christ-sounding language? It is full of pointing to this idea of an everlasting kingdom with an everlasting ruler that comes through David. Now, this just makes it clear. This eternal kingdom, this chosen seed, this blessing to the earth, comes to this line. Now, how does this tie into Christ? 
now that we know this Messiah, this Messianic figure is coming through these Old Testament figures, how do we see this in the New Testament? Because we know we are not under the Old Law, but we are under this New Testament, this New Testament law given to us by Christ. So how does Christ make this point? How does he fit into this? Well, to put it simple, first, we need to establish that Christ is the descendant of these two. A big part of Jewish thought and Jewish identity is keeping track of their genealogies and always understanding where did you come from? Who's who? Who's your family? Who are you related to? And we have this very easily demonstrated in the first verse in the New Testament, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Let's turn over with me. It's a short, simple verse, but it makes the point here. <clears throat> so Matthew 1, verse 1. The book of, of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. There you go. Christ is not only just a descendant of David, but is also a descendant of Abraham. Right there at the first verse. But now, how do we know that Christ is this one that is going to establish this eternal kingdom that is always talked about? This kingdom that was going to last forever and bless the earth. Turn over with me just a couple chapters later to Matthew 13, or Matthew 3, 13 through 17. The context here, this is John the Baptist. He's been about baptizing people. And this is the baptism of Christ himself. So let's read through it, and I think we're going to see some very striking things when it comes to this idea of Christ being the one to establish this kingdom as part of the seed promise. So start with me in verse 13. We're going to read through verse 17. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be now, for thus it is becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went straight up, straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. There is that same language again. Christ is the Son of God. This is very easily, when Jewish thought, this is what this all strikes back to. These passages of the descendant being the son, not only of a physical man, but the son of God himself. This Messiah is Christ. The seed promise, this, na- this, this seed that will bless all the earth is Christ. But this isn't the only demonstration of this. And... Let's bounce out of the book of Matthew and go over to Acts. But one quick last point about this passage we just read. This is also, is particularly if you're Jewish watching this scene of Christ being baptized and coming up out of the water. If you're immersed at all in what we consider to be the Old Testament, you realize this is a callback to Isaiah 11 too, Where it says this Messiah is going to come out of the line of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. It explicitly states that in Isaiah 11 too. So not only do we have the same language, but we have an exact reference to something we would consider in the Old Testament as an authoritative source on where the Messiah is coming from. But this final call I want to discuss is going to be Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. This is the Peter preaching for the first time after the ascension of Christ. And I mean, and he makes it fairly clear here who Christ is to the crowd. So we're going to read verses 29 through 36. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and in his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, that he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, and his soul was not left in hell, neither in his flesh did it see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth his this, which ye know and see and hear. For David 
is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes a footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. I don't think it gets any more clear than this. Jesus is the Christ, the blessing, the seed. And it all comes through David. And as we all know, David is also a descendant of Abraham. So this promise, this seed promise, that the Messiah, the Christ, would come, Jesus is that fulfillment. And I don't think there's anything more clear than Acts 2. That is not only does it come through Abraham, but the line of David. The specificity is there with Christ. That it's all coming through the way God had planned. And that Christ is the seed. So, in concluding today, I would always love to extend the invitation of the gospel. We know that Christ is the seed. We've established that. But Christ had a way, the good news, the gospel. Now, some of us who are listening may have already responded to this and been baptized. But if you need to make a confession, get your life right with God, and you need some help, feel free to reach out to the contact information on the slide here. Or feel free to get in contact with one of your elders. And if you have yet to respond to the gospel, we give you that invitation openly. If you feel the need to be baptized, please get in contact with us using the information below or anything you have necessary. We thank you for listening today, and if you feel any need to respond, please let us know. Thank you.